So I'm going to talk a little bit about antiquity in the Middle Ages. And let me remind those of you who are not professional historians among us that history is not a finished cathedral in which we can go in and admire beautiful things that are all set and done. History is a construction site. And particularly today, as we begin to apply science to the material remains of the past, we, this is an ongoing affair in which we're learning what's going on and have just begun to put the pieces together. So this is a report on very unfinished business. The written history of Western Eurasia teaches us that there were at least four major pandemics, three under the Roman Empire and one at the end of the Middle Ages, at the beginning of modern Europe. Under the Roman Empire, the big three uh, were the Antonine Plague in the middle of the second century, pathogen unknown, Galen described it and uh, thought that it might have, it, it sounds like it could have smallpox, but there's no biological evidence of that. Um, the Psyllian Plague was unknown practically until 2015, and uh, a PhD in this department, Kyle Harper, former PhD, uh, resurrected a lot of unknown written evidence documenting it. Pathogen unknown resembles Ebola. The third was the longest lasting pandemic of antiquity, the Justinianic plague that started in the pandemic that started in the middle of the sixth century and ran to the middle of the eighth century, which is identified as bubonic plague. And then fourthly, we have at the end of the Middle Ages, the second bubonic plague, plague pandemic that began with the Black Death, crossed the Mediterranean from the Black Sea and reached all around Europe and back into Asia starting in 1346, and then had a numerous outbreaks that continued until the 18th century. So it's important to realize that we know about ancient and medieval plagues thanks to the written records and that they are rich but uneven. There are huge gaps in the <clears throat> records that allow for different interpretations if we just focus on the written records. Archaeoscience has begun to change things in a big way. In 2010, an international team was able to demonstrate robustly that the ancient DNA of the bacteria that killed these people in the Black Death was still preserved in their skeletons. It turns out after a hundred years of debate of people saying, no, it couldn't possibly have been bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis, it, it wasn't significant, it wasn't important, it wasn't plague. It turns out it was plague. And now we're in the process of reconstructing that uh, pandemic based on the genetics uh, of the people who died there. The, it's important to grasp too that the broader science of the human past is casting totally unexpected light on the impact of these ancient and medieval pandemics. Um, our historical ice core team in, in a project that together with the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine has reconstructed metal production in medieval Europe based on the lead pollution, the smelting of lead and silver production. And we see to our astonishment that Europe has been polluting itself with lead in the atmosphere intensively for the last thousand years, with one exception, a five-year period starting in 1349, when the Black Death killed so many miners that it devastated lead production. And for the only time in the last thousand years, except perhaps now under COVID-19, when we see exactly the same phenomenon, the uh, air over Europe returned to natural levels of lead. The main focus of my own personal research has been on the Justinianic bubonic plague pandemic that began in 541. Um, the uh, accounts of it are vivid at the beginning and then become less frequent thereafter. Um, according to eyewit an eyewitness that when it hit the capital of the Roman Empire, Constantinople in 542, the devastation was so great that the emperor commanded accounts to stand at the gates and count the body being carried out. They gave up in despair at 250,000 individuals. Uh, some people dismiss this evidence, other people think it's serious. According to the spot, spotty written records, plague returned between 18 and 35 times over this 200 year period. What were its effects? Did these effects differ according to time and place? Opinion differ. The older scholarship minimized the influence of disease on history and particularly of the pandemics. It's often not even mentioned in histories written in the 60s, 70s and uh, 60s and 70s. So how do we determine what happened and how significant it was. This is an ongoing inquiry, and the first big step was taken by another international team in 2013, when they proved from victims' skeletons in Bavaria, where there is total silence on the presence of plague, that those people died around 550 of Yersinia pestis. 
Um, we joined the Science of the Human Past at Harvard, joined forces with the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Germany, and uh, began a systematic study of skeletons, identification of skeletons of people who might have died in the Justinianic pandemic, looking for the ancient DNA of, their, of the disease that took them down. We're combining history, philology, digital humanities, archeology, span and archeogenetics in this inquiry. You can go to our digital atlas of the Roman and medieval civilization and find there a preliminary uh, geodatabase of outbreaks of plague, of epidemics rather, of all sorts. Uh, um, we've begun to compile uh, inventories of the archaeological evidence of mass death. On this uh, map, the, the triangle, the diamonds in red, are places in which the ancient DNA has robustly demonstrated that individuals in those graves died of Yersinia pestis, of bubonic plague. In October 2016, our team was very lucky to identify this only the second place on Earth where bubonic plague from the 6th century has been identified, 30 kilometers from the first place, also in Bavaria, where there is no written record. Here, the genome was so well represented, uh, so well preserved, that Michal Feldman, the lead author of the study, led us all in reconstructing the whole genome which is fantastic because as more victims emerge, we'll be able to compare the genomes and trace the minor uh, um, mutations that occur from genome to genome and so track the spread of the disease across the ancient space. Just as scientists today are tracking uh, uh, COVID-19 through the mutations of the RNA in different victims. Six months ago, we published a new study in which we went from two to 10 sites. We have eight new sites with the ancient DNA of victims of bubonic plague, four more in Bavaria, set a total of eight sites with no written records, two from France, one from Spain, and one where I, I would not have believed it. I did not believe the, the, the bad written records from Britain. <clears throat> so what are the takeaways? It's a work in progress, but we have entered a new era of molecular historical knowledge. We have been able, uh, present day scholars and scientists, to identify definitively and robustly the pathogen of two of the greatest pandemics in recorded history. We're beginning to see the specific historical conditions of their impact, the existence of robust and intense communication networks, the shipping of the Roman Empire or of medieval trade that moved the rats that are the carriers of bubonic plague around the world, the, ro the airliners that move the humans that are the carrier of COVID-19 around the world, the economic impact still being assessed in terms of demography, already clear for the Black Death, under debate for the Justinianic pandemic. A positive side, if you survive the, Burbe the uh, Black Death or, or the Justinianic pandemic, you were lucky because everybody else died and you inherited wealth. The per capita wealth increases in times of pandemic. The challenges are great. Before the pandemic that we are living through, I had not been as profoundly moved by the constant expressions of fear and terror that litter the sources from the ancient world that describe this and the deep anxiety. The shaking of institutions and belief structures is perceptible and clearer to me today because of our present experiences. The scapegoating tragically as well. There's also adaptation. Uh, in the, uh, both in the Justinianic pandemic and certainly in the Black Death, it becomes clear that distancing was understood to make a difference. And so we use today the medieval Venetian word quarantina because the Venetian Republic in the Black Death adopted the law that ships that were coming from plague ports had to stand off of port for 40 days, quarantina, to make sure that anybody who had the plague on board was dead before they came into Venice. And also the shortage in, of labor probably encouraged various labor saving technologies. There's much to be discovered, but I'll leave it here and pass the, the word to my dear colleagues. Thank you.